Um, hunger and thirst for righteousness. Righteousness. My question as I listened to the sermon again was that was an that was a really ugly picture pastor first of all that one with the turkey and all the spots on it it took us a minute to figure out what that was that's um, funny <laughs> blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they will be filled pastor what if i don't hunger and thirst um for righteousness how do i begin to cultivate an appetite for righteousness. What if I don't even know I should have an appetite for righteousness? That's why you should have been listening to the sermon because somebody has to tell you how can one hear unless one preach. And so how do how do you, once you've heard that you should hunger and thirst, how do you go about that? And it's basically, which also in Matthew 6, it says, seek ye first the kingdom. So we're, we're doing all this, 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 um, these, this series on the kingdom and we're talking about the kingdom. And if you go back from the beginning, we all we're talking about is how we should act. And as you are, are you are, as you're behaving or as you are doing the things that the, the Beatitudes say that you will be happy or blessed, it will automatic the thirst and the hunger will become automatic. And the reason you know that you're not hungering and thirsting for righteousness is because you stay hungry and you stay thirsty. You stay looking for other things to fill that void. We, we all, we're, we're naturally hungry and thirsty, but when you don't thirst after righteousness, when you're not looking for right standing with God, then you stay hungry for the wrong things. And like I said, when I was preaching, you feel that you fit, you try to fill that void with everything you can think of with addiction, with, Drugs, alcohol, sex, relationships, uh, performance, um, you know, just a lot of different things trying to fill that place that only when you thirst and you hunger after him, after right standing with God, will it will be filled. So I think about um, so many who begin their relationship with Jesus, you know, later in, in life. They didn't they didn't grow up in church. Um Maybe they were the Christmas and Easter um, CEOs. Christmas and Easter only um, went with grandma or mama. And so their appetites up until this point have been fueled by the things of the world. You make this statement. Um, see, when you control hunger, you control life. Find out what a man's deepest appetite is and provide it to him. And you can control him. So I, again, I think about the person who, you know, 20, 30 years, their appetites have been other things. And now they're hearing for the first time, oh, wait a minute, I should have an a, a appetite. And a hunger for right. The other question is, how do I recognize that that's what the hunger is? Like, I know when I get hungry, sometimes I just want food. It doesn't matter what it is. But other times I want, I have an appetite for a specific thing. Like you said, the red velvet cake or, oh, I really want, there was one day I wanted macaroni and cheese so bad and I had no energy to make it that I sent my child to go get mac and cheese from Chick-fil-A. I'm sorry I, to hear that. <laughs> it wasn't bad. It was cheesy. For, okay. Anyway, don't, don't be a food snob, but I had a taste for cheesy macaroni and cheese. How do we identify, if, if, if we're new to this thing, how do we know that that's what we're hungering for? What are some of perhaps the hunger pains that tell us that we're hungering and thirsting after God and not just restless or not just unhappy or not just... One way you know is because you're never filled. No matter what you do, it doesn't feel that place. It doesn't feel that void. And so it's almost meant to be that way to get you to turn to him, mm. to start to hunger after him. Unfortunately, it takes a lot of disappointments and a lot of letdowns and a lot of other things that you realize that you're trying to feel this void and that natural sustenance just will not do. 
And so now you begin to ask the questions, well, God, I just, I just want to be close to you. My thing is how I started is God, I just want to be right. And, and that's still my prayer now, even though it started out as a babe or immature as immature coming up. My prayer has always been, God, I just want to be right. I just want to be right before you. I, I'm not really into all of the rules and regulations and the jumps and the judgments and all that other stuff that people have falsely claim Christianity to be, I just want to be right before you. It's that, it's that want to just be right mm-hmm. and not just be right in myself, but just be right before you. I want you, I want to be in right standing with you. I believe if I'm in right standing with you, then everything else will fall into place. When my relationship with you lacks, or if I'm not right, I, you know, you know, when you're not right, you know what I mean? It's, even as a pastor, I think people don't realize we're people too. And so I, I know when I'm just not right. I, I just know, yeah, that my response to, to whatever, it just wasn't right. My thought pattern, it's just not right. And that's the hunger. It's like, no, this just ain't going to do. I want to be right before him. I thirst for right standing. That's what righteousness means, right standing in him, I, I I thirst for that. I'm hungry for that. And anything else that tries to mask itself as that, it won't do because I'm not fulfilled at the I'm, end of the day. I'm not healed. If I think back um, just on my relationship with Jesus, even though I was raised in the church and accepted him early, probably when I was younger, I had that hunger and thirst and then other things came in and I began to feed on other things and develop an appetite for other things. And it wasn't until um, later that I got back to that place where um, first I thought I had to earn his pleasure and then I thought I had to work to be in right standing. And then it seemed like there was this maturing where you get to the point and it's like, Lord, like, I just want to be right before you. I understand you love me. I can't earn your love. There's nothing else I can do. I just want to know we good. That nothing that I've done or an attitude or anything else that stands in the way of me and you. And I think that's part of that when you're not satisfied. Because even we'll sometimes try to fill that hunger with good works. Yeah. With, I was uh, talking to some young people. Uh, I love my young people. They really keep me encouraged. And um, yesterday before service, I was talking to one of my uh, one of my high schoolers and they were saying that they just kind of felt off. You know, it just kind of felt like they were disconnected and things that they needed to do. And I had to look at them and I said, you do understand that if you want to please God in your heart, you do. And you could just see the light bulbs kind of come on like, so I don't have to do anything. You don't have to do anything to please him. The want to please him is enough. Now, because you want to, your actions will follow. And don't miss me when you don't. There is uh, there is consequences for that as well. But if we can get people to understand real relationship starts in the heart and the want to, then that, it changes everything. It's not a what you do. So me hungering and thirsting to be right, I just want to be right before you, even before I do anything. I want my heart to be postured right. I want mm-hmm. my mind to be postured right before mm-hmm. you. I want to think on things that are lovely and the God of peace be with me. I want my heart to be on things above and 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 I want my heart to be on you and your righteousness. And so I think when we say hunger and thirst, we think about actions. We think about, well, what do we have to do to show that we're hungry? You don't have to do anything. Just be, mm-hmm. just be hungry. Just, mm-hmm. just be after right standing in your heart and your actions will follow. It's I had another one of my young people text me this morning. And I, when I was, before I started preaching, I think it was in the sermon when I was talking about prayer and I was talking about just, at, just talk to Jesus and sit. And for the first mm-hmm. time he did, and he texted me, let me know that he heard God. And he said, I heard him, but I thought it was something else. And I tried to, you know, kind of block it out or whatever. And no, it was actually God. And I said, because you were hungering after righteousness, you wanted to hear him. Mm-hmm. And if we can get 35% of people to just understand 
that it's not about what you do. We're, we've just been raised and it, it started with bad doctrine in church. It starts all the way in the New Testament about the doctrine of works and all you can't work your way into hunger. You can't work your way into righteousness. It has to be a matter of a heart and the heart action will then play out in your daily actions. But you cannot, this is not a, I'm going to serve. So I want to be, I remember I used to say all the time, you know, I just want to be in purpose. You know, I just, I just want to do the will of the father, you know, all of those things that cause so much anxiety. And the truth of the matter is he looks at the heart, but that's a scary thing as well, because the heart of a man is terribly wicked. Who can know it? I think we, we lost her again. We're humble. I lose you again? Go ahead. All right. You said in your sermon that when we are hungry, all we have to do is ask to be filled. So you sent us to Matthew 7. And the wonderful thing about the God we serve is that when we ask, he answers. <laughs> he fills us up. Because he honors the longing in our heart. I love what uh, Trotty said, kind of piggybacking on what you he... said that when you have an appetite, feast it on sugar. Uh, perhaps a little bit. And so now, all we want is sugar. So even though we're filled, we stay hungry because we want to continue to stay on appetite. Feast it on sugar. Does that make sense, Pastor? Yeah, I was trying to, you you kept breaking up in between uh, what was happening. So I was trying to pick you up on YouTube. Yeah, we just have, we're having a bad connection night. We never That's because, that's because the enemy don't want people to be hungry. I believe that. I definitely <laughs> believe that. So any other thoughts or questions about this for everyone? Because if not, we're going to go to this uh, past week's sermon about mercy. 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 Okay, I want to know how many people actually saw the movie Just Mercy. If you did, just put me in the chat. We actually, uh, because I saw Pastor Slack, it's before Sunday, watched it with the family. Was actually, it was a good movie. People to watch it, but the script of feeling or an emotion, but rather in action. The merciful are those whose hearts are tender and who truly feel in the deepest parts of their being the pain and the suffering of those who need help. And Pastor, as I'm talking to my 23-year-old and my 19-year-old, and again, like you said, I love talking to young people because they keep it real and they um, are pretty just authentic about their experiences and what they're going through. What I am finding is um, we are living in a time where people, we don't feel we don't feel even for ourselves. We don't take time to, to, to feel emotions for ourselves, rather less feel it for somebody else. And I think you talked about this, was it last week or a couple of weeks ago when you talked about empathy um, and the fact that 
we don't have empathy and that kind of ties into compassion. So I guess my first question would be before I can even get to feeling mercy, how do I have capacity to just to empathize? Well, the, the culture has taught us that feelings are wrong. Um, you know, you can't be emotional, not to cry, not to, you know, nobody cares about your feelings. And so we turn them off. Um, and so, especially I was so guilty of this in my early stages of ministry, I was wrongly taught that feelings were just empty emotions and that we weren't really allowed to have them. So I turned into this very mean, um, straightforward type of person. I didn't show any emotion. I was all about business and I love Jesus. Um, and so one day the Holy Spirit said, well, why don't you smile because you love Jesus, but can't nobody tell. <laughs> and I literally had to start practicing smiling. I still don't do a real good job of it today. I'm, I'm better. Um, but because we, I was taught not to feel. And so because everything is happening in the world, it is almost making us cynical. It almost makes us, you know, just, I mean, I remember a long time ago, you hear about somebody dying and it was like, oh my God, they died. And now it's like such a died. And it's just like, oh, and then you kind of move on. You know what I'm saying? From, I remember school shootings. I remember the first school shooting, it was like the worst thing ever. Like it was on the news, everybody was there. And now you hear about a school shooting and it's just like, oh, okay, yeah, that's sad. We're gonna pray for that. But it's no, that the emotions are detached and that's why we can't have mercy for others because for you to have mercy, you have to feel. And it's okay to feel. It's not okay to be led by your feelings, but it is okay to feel. Emotions are neither right nor wrong. They just are. But if we mask them and we, we stuff them and we try to act like, they don't exist. Anything that you rep that that you suppress or anything that you push down, it comes out ugly. So mm -hmm. they eventually come out in ugly ways. Mm -hmm. But part of the reason we can't empathize with other people because we can't even empathize with ourselves. No. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. And unfortunately, I think there are uh, many people who have learned to stuff their emotions, to hide their emotions, to deny their emotions. Um, when, I, when we have people who are in touch with their emotions and, and are compassionate and empathetic, sometimes they're accused of being soft or, right. or overly emotional. And yet um, those are the ones that I have found truly are the most empathetic and the most merciful because they can relate. And so just like we talked about um developing a hunger. Any advice, Pastor, on how to develop mercy and compassion so that we can put compassion into action? Especially, again, if you've been brought up in a way that, again, I'm thinking about so many who didn't grow up in church or maybe they did and it's still like, well, I'm supposed to take care of me. I can't worry about anybody else. Or I got enough on my plate right now. How I don't have the capacity to feel mercy for somebody else. And, and what, we, what we tell ourselves is truly contrary to what the scripture says, because the scripture says, whatsoever you do to my little ones, you do unto me. So if we're going to be Christian, we're supposed to treat each other as Christ would treat them. Mm. So how we are supposed to love and how we're supposed to care. So when I see you, I don't just see you as another human being. I see you as another one of God's children. And because you are his, then I am to do to you as he would do to you or as he has done to me. Mm -hmm. And if we start looking at people, not just who they are in their natural self, but really looking at every individual as a child of God who Christ died for and treat them accordingly, 
then mercy is easy. Mm. Mm. I'm it's gonna, the way that we categorize people. It's the way that we deem who's worthy and who's not. It is the way that our selfish nature, which is our default, which is self-preservation, has us focusing more on us than others. The whole thing about the kingdom is other, others minded. That, that, that sums up every sermon that I, we have preached for the last 12 weeks. Mm -hmm. Is that we can't, you can't focus on you, but can you imagine if we're all others minded, then that also means somebody else is taking care of you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's like in marriage. We say all the time, if you serve like you're supposed to, not only are you meeting your spouse's needs, but your needs will be met by your spouse. If the reciprocal is happening, like it's supposed to. Yes. Yes. I want to go back to what you said. We're so busy categorizing um, people. Another, I think mercy ties into forgiveness. Um, very much so. And we choose maybe who we want to forgive. Or we, we deem certain acts unforgivable. And so probably in the same way, we, we deem who we can give mercy to and who we don't think deserve mercy but see the difference is with mercy and and forgiveness is remember forgiveness is just a cancel of debt mm. and so you can forgive and not extend mercy i can forgive and act but i don't have to show compassion toward the person who committed that act hmm and that's where it gets real sticky because even in the story of the unmerciful servant, he had just got the, the biggest debt ever free. You know, you know what I'm saying? It was, it was, you know, it was casted off. It was forgiven. But he didn't have the compassion for someone else who had a debt against him when he had the same power to forgive or to cancel mm -hmm. the debt. He didn't have mm -hmm. compassion. Mm -hmm. And that's why he didn't do so. Mercy is compassion in action. It, it is taking that even though they're not worthy per se, it's still extended because we weren't worthy. And it was extended to us. I'm just gonna say, I wonder if part of our challenge with mercy is that we've forgotten or don't fully understand how much mercy has been shown to us. Yes. And that's why the scripture says those, if you give mercy, you'll receive mercy because you reap what you sow. It's the law of reciprocity. Mm -hmm. We've forgotten how much of a wretch undone we were. Mm -hmm. I don't think we really, really realize how messed up we were. I realize because I got people around me that remind me often. <laughs> you want to know how messed up I was? Ask my husband. He will tell you the truth. And it's, yeah. and it's sad that you've been with somebody all your life because they remember all your stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He will tell you about me being seven years old in the corner all the time at camp because I was cussing the camp counselor out. He'll tell you those kind of things. He reminds me often of how terrible I was and that it is the mercy of God that I'm standing where I'm standing today. But I don't think we do a real self-evaluation because we always make us uh, appear better than what we were. Mm -hmm. we have the we weren't that bad mm -hmm. like you know i was in sin i was in mm -hmm. some stuff but i wasn't as bad as mm -hmm. so and so or mm -hmm. i you know my, at least i didn't you know i don't have that story i was a mess mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. that's the end of the sentence mm -hmm. and i it's think the grace of god again that I has called me to be who i am and where I am. Nothing great that I've done. Yeah. And I don't forget that. And that's why I extend mercy. Because when you truly understand 
that you don't deserve what you have, you will never withhold mercy from anyone else. Does mercy mean I excuse sin? No. Jesus didn't excuse sin. He paid the price for it. <laughs> he didn't excuse it. And I don't have to agree with your sin or your stuff to have mercy. But I tell my kids all the time, I'm trying to teach my young men to be men of their word, integral. So, hey, they don't try this with all kids. This is what I'm trying with my kids. I'm not saying that this is the way it should go. But when my son comes and asks me, can he go somewhere? The first question is, what time are you going to be back? I don't set a curfew. I ask him what time he's going to be back. And he tells me what time he's going to be back. And so when that time comes and he's not back, when he comes in with the explanation, I'm trying to teach you to be a person of your word, but I'm going to give you mercy. Where punishment should be, I'm going to give you mercy this time because I'm trying to teach you something. I'm trying to show you something. So I have mercy. There's many times when punishment is deserved, especially in my house raising teenagers. But what better way to teach mercy when you should be punished for what you have done I'm going to give you, I'm going to compassion in action. I'm, 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 I'm going to forgive that. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to let it, I'm going to let it ride. I'm going to show compassion to you. I'm going to give you mercy today. And then what's amazing is it's amazing how they correct their own behavior because they know that they weren't worthy. They should have gotten the repercussion of their action, but because I've had mercy, it has taught them to correct their action and have mercy on somewhere else. So if I fall short and didn't do something that I was supposed to do, their response usually is, that's okay, mom. Yeah, Because I've shown them mercy. Therefore, they give mercy in return. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Charlie was saying the same thing. God's mercy is that he does not give us what we deserve. And so- yes. So mercy is there usually is a um somewhere in this transaction there is a punishment deserved or there is a, a repercussion that is deserved. There is a there is something negative that is deserved. Yeah. There is a debt on your account and you deserve to pay for it one way or another and mercy is not saying you oh you didn't do that i'm gonna right. ignore that mercy i fully deserve i'm gonna withhold it and give you compassion and understand In, in another chance, same way, we owe a debt to God. But he showed compassion instead of asking for payment for the debt. You gotta make me shout right there because I know yeah. that my debt list is long. And I love how you brought that to home, how we, um, sometimes I think when I remember reading scripture about what we are supposed to do unto others uh, a while, a long time ago and thinking, I got really excited and I was like, okay, I'm a, when I go to church on Sunday, I'm going to forgive others and I'm going to be patient with others. And then the Holy Spirit like tapped me on the shoulder and went, no, 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 that starts at home. Right. So are you going to be
patient with the people at home uh, in your family relationships and the people you live with every day. Yeah. And that's the thing. We, as Christians, we want to do everything at church and to the people who believe like us because it's easy. Mm-hmm. 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 I, I would tell the story and I probably shouldn't, but <laughs> I'm out here now. <laughs> Uh, my, my husband was in the driveway talking to his brother mm. a couple of weeks ago. And my husband's brother has three sons and we have two sons. So it's five of them and they're all a year apart. Literally, they're stair steps. And so his brother got a new um, um, van for his company and he just came by to show the van and the boys were outside. That was about 5, 30, 6 o'clock in the evening. And... Um, you know, they're, they're boys. So, you know, they're running around playing or whatever. And the police showed up. And so he said that somebody called the police and said that there was a domestic violence situation at my house. Now, mind you, everybody on the street know that I'm the pastor of Faith Fellowship Church. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the police officer was real nice. He got out, talked to John a little bit, and he was like, no, they're just kids, you know, whatever. And so the police officer actually told me which house called the police on me. And so I started to go over there and knock on the door. Now that probably wouldn't have been a good thing to do. But when we found, when they were in trouble, something was happening with them in their garage or whatever, we didn't hesitate to show compassion to help them. Even though they called and said something false against us, which was wrong, which was the debt. We still showed compassion. We gave mercy when we didn't have to, because that's who we are. People know who they are. The question always is, who are you? Are mm -hmm. you citizen of the kingdom that's going to show mercy, even though when somebody is petty across the street calling the police on me for no reason? Hmm. Yes. So this is an everyday thing. This is not just what happens in church. You have to have that same compassion for people who are not Christian or who do you wrong or who don't believe like you believe or who don't deserve. I got a neighbor next door that still ain't spoke to me. It's been almost three years, but every chance I get, I'm trying to show compassion because we know who they are. The question always it's who are we thank you for reminding us again this whole series is lifestyles of the kingdom and it is about how we should live how we should be as kingdom citizens and it's not just for our own good for us to pat ourselves on the back and say oh what a good christian i am but we are here to draw others to Christ. And if our actions and our, our way of interacting with, especially with those who treat us unfairly, who have an attitude towards us, who have a different perspective and different beliefs and different lifestyles, if we don't look any different than the rest of the world, if we don't live like we belong to another kingdom, then we are not serving our purpose here because our purpose is to be billboards and to manifest the love of God, not just by what we say, not just by how we protest and, and what we post on Facebook, but how we live and interact daily with others. Um, and the purpose of being king of citizens is to spread the good news. Spread the gospel. I think we forget that Christianity is not just to save yourself. I'm saved, so I'm good. No, our whole point in Christianity is to win somebody else to Christ. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't think we, I don't know, I think that for, hmm, I'm gonna go on a little soapbox and then we go come back. Thank you for saying that because I, I get the feeling, especially this has been a hard year. I mean, we are all struggling. We all have been tuning in every Sunday, looking for a word for us to get us through the next week. And there is nothing wrong with that. Um, we are the household of faith. We're the hospital for the sick. And sometimes the, the caregivers are the sick at the same time. But we must not forget, we are not just here for us to get by. 
We are here to share the gospel with others. So if you get a word for you, you need to go find somebody to share that word with to encourage them with the same word you were encouraged with. Or demonstrate that word that others may see and cause them to want to come and serve this man called Jesus. And that's the other thing. You may not have to say anything. If we were, if we were Bibles in action, like we're supposed to be, you don't have to say anything. People will see your light in your life and they will inquire what's different about you. Yes, yes, yes. So as we get to almost the end of this uh, kingdom lifestyle, one, it is um, instructional so that we can kind of look and take an account of ourselves and go, does my lifestyle reflect the kingdom that I say I serve? And if not, Lord, where do I need to, where do we need to adjust? What conversations do we need to have? Where do I need to repent, get things together, make an adjustment? But also, I want to get these things right so that we, the way we live, can draw others to Christ. And now, more than ever, people need Jesus. They are living out here with no hope. They are angry. They are frustrated. They are scared. And the only answer to all of their issues is not government. Government it will come and ask us the question. So thank you so much. Sorry, my dog you. is barking. I heard, I heard. We're about to wrap up here. Um, does anybody, we've been, again, when you guys let us talk way too much, do you guys have any questions about the sermon the past two weeks or about the whole series? Um, if you do, we'll give you a few minutes to put them in the chat here or to text our number. Pastor. Do you want to give us a quick? You brought um, you. You paused. Say it okay. again. What is Sundays? Where are we landing on Sunday? Oh, we're talking about persecution. Mm. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Mm. That don't sound like fun. I know, but if you do all the rest of them right, persecution is going to come, and it should. Mm. Well, we encourage you all to join us next Sunday, either in person or online. We apologize for tonight's technical difficulties. That's what happens when everybody comes home from college and everybody's <laughs> just but we will get this together uh, for the next time. And um, again, if you have any questions after the fact, you can always text us at our all-purpose text number, 330-427-3819. Or... or you can question. And if again, if you've got a prayer request for you or someone else, you can also use that same number or go on to our website and there's a prayer request form to send those in. We wanna to continue to support one another, especially this time of the year. People are um, struggling closer to the holidays. It's been a long year and um, we wanna make sure that we finish out the year better together and not leave anybody behind that is, might be out there on their own. So everybody have a great evening. Thank you for being with us, Pastor. Thank you for tuning in with us tonight and going more in depth on your sermons. Um, be blessed everyone and have a great week. We will see you on Sunday. Have a good one.